There were some significant changes regarding the Reserve Bank recently. Philip Lowe's term as Reserve Bank Governor wasn't renewed, which means he's effectively been sacked as a Reserve Bank Governor, and the current Deputy Governor, Michelle Bullock, will become the Governor starting 18th of September. Now, in my mind, you'll need to learn from two basic mistakes Philip Lowe made if he wants to secure two terms and not be booted out like Philip Lowe was. The first mistake Lowe made was not to admit he made an error when he forecast that interest rates would stay low until 2024. And we're not even there 2024 yet. And as I'm sure as a property investor you know, that prompted a surge in bank mortgage lending, which is now causing a lot of economic harm. The second big mistake that Bullock needs to learn from Lowe and the Reserve Bank's board is the over-reliance on statistics and information from its own economists in Sydney's Martin Place and those from the Government Treasury in Canberra. Because in general, they've always been behind with their statistics. As I see it, Bullock must change the way in which the Reserve Bank collects and interprets its information. But my guest today, Dr. Andrew Wilson, has got even more harsh things to say about the mistakes made by Philip Lowe. Now, regular listeners would know I record a weekly video with Andrew Wilson, and what we're going to play in a moment is the audio of last week's Property Insider video. Now, you don't really need to see us face-to-face, but Andrew will be discussing some of his latest property data about the capital cities and how the various regions within them are working. And if you're keen to see the charts, I'm going to leave a link in the show notes so you can see them. Okay, so let's hear what Dr. Andrew Wilson has to say about the sacking of Philip Lowe. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Philip Lowe was effectively sacked as a Reserve Bank Governor and Australia's next Reserve Bank Governor, Michelle Bullock, is going to take office in September at a time when Much of the bank's work fighting inflation may well have already been done, and the focus is now going to be on changing the way the Reserve Bank operates. Now, she's already Reserve Bank uh, Deputy Governor, being appointed by our previous Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, in April last year. Both Treasurer Jim Chalmers and Prime Minister Anthony Albanese say she's the right person to implement recommendations of the independent review of the bank. That's intended to make the bank less insular, and more open to outside perspectives. Yet, as a 38-year veteran of the bank, having joined in 1985, she could perhaps be seen as just another insider. So why was Philip Lowe passed over? What does this mean for interest rates in our property markets? That's what I want to ask Australia's leading housing economist, Dr. Andrew Wilson, Chief Economist of My Housing Market, in this week's Property Insider Chat. We're also going to have a look at what's happening to building costs, how the various regions of our big capital cities are performing, and what the auction markets are telling us about buyer and seller sentiment. Hello, Andrew. Yes, good day, Michael. Very interesting introduction uh, from yourself. And we've got a lot to cover today, so I won't get too bogged down in the argy-bargy of the appointment of the new governor for the Reserve Bank. But uh, yeah, a little bit of a, uh, I'm not so sure that a 38-year year veteran of the Reserve Bank is going to be the, the new broom that sweeps clean. But we'll see. But the political fluff is becoming fluffier by the day, I think. But good luck to the new governor. I'm not so sure the uh, inflation fighting is behind us by the time she gets there, but let's hope it is. I think there's a lot of work to do going forward. And as usual, there's always challenges in economics. The Reserve Bank Governor is the spokesperson for a group of people. And I guess a counter argument could be that uh, Michelle Bullock wasn't part of the group helping make interest rate decisions, which has obviously brought the bank under a lot of scrutiny. So look, let's get down to tin tax. Why was Philip Lowe sacked? 
Well, look, uh, as I mentioned before, economics is always a difficult process. There's a lot that you just can't refer to the textbooks in in a sense, and uh, we know that. And because of that, you know, we tend to be perhaps a little circumspect when things don't work out as they're supposed to or as as they're planned to do. But I think the issues around the previous governor were becoming such that change had to be made, in my opinion. It's, it's, It's one thing to have some questions about the outcomes, but I think there were more than just some questions, and uh, I think that load eventually became a too much to carry for those, you know, making the reappointment decisions. And we have been, and I have been a critic of this Reserve Bank covenant. You've got to understand that, you know, that position is a difficult one. As I said, economics is an art rather than a science. Uh, a lot of economists disagree with me, but you have to have some sort of scientific background to what you do when you are the highest economic policymaker in the country, per se, as the uh, Reserve Bank. I, as I said, I think that there were, were some issues there that really over the longer term had question marks rising against the Reserve Bank's performance. I've always said that there's been too much focus from the Reserve Bank, the current Reserve Bank board on the housing market. I think the housing market is a product of the economy and policies, and it shouldn't lead the process. But I do think the Reserve Bank had the housing market leading the process in terms of their policy positions over a long period. And I think that that caused some significant mistakes, in my opinion, in terms of the positioning of monetary policy. Maybe we should just go back a step and remind people that the mandate of the Reserve Bank is to have stability of our Australian currency, to provide full employment, and also to provide the economic prosperity and welfare for the Australian people. That's very broad, and it also only has... I guess one, well, I was going to say one instrument, which is the interest rates, but it has another one also, the rhetoric, what it says, because yes. its message is uh, clearly listened to. And there were some interesting messages, let's call them interesting, uh, talking about interest rates a couple of years ago, that led a lot of people to make purchasing decisions yes. when they were led to believe interest rates weren't going to rise till 2024. Hey, we're not even there yet. And look what's happened to interest rates. Yeah, that's right. And I think part of those forward modelling and and presentations that the Reserve Bank Governor was making was the issue. It is difficult even to forecast, you know, six months ahead rather than two or three years ahead. And I think the Reserve Bank Governor got into plenty of hot water, uh, not just with the recent interest rates wouldn't rise till 2024 mantra that got him into some trouble, but also previously as well. And I think that's, that's a dangerous position to be in, to be giving those types of forecasts because we know that things can occur from left field. We've seen that GFC, COVID, you know, that turned the world upside down. And that's why you should be very careful about those forecasts. Plus, they give a margin to speculators, you know, at the end of the day. People are guided, as you said, by the what the Reserve Bank's saying. They can make significant financial decisions based on it. I, I think it goes back to 2015 and, and that period, 2015 and 18. We know the New Zealand Reserve Bank came up with this, uh, you know, fancy macro prudential policy position, which was to manipulate the housing market by reducing access to finance from investors. That's turned out to be a disaster in New Zealand. Of course, New Zealand is in a recession now, and its housing market is still in a very questionable state in terms of balance. Those uh, policies didn't uh, make any difference on the positive side, and certainly some very strong arguments to say that it made things worse, particularly for first home buyers in New Zealand. And they've certainly got a solid reputation as well, the uh, New Zealand Reserve Bank. And they have said quite clearly that they will not be increasing interest rates anytime soon because of the stress that that's caused uh, their policies, of course, on the economy. But if we remember back in 2015-18, Uh, That period, actually, Australia's Reserve Bank governor, which was cheering along, as was Treasury and other policymakers in Australia, were cheering along this, uh, you know, newfangled policy of macro prudential control. And that resulted in a severe credit squeeze on investors in this country, which, in my opinion, is one of the factors that's created the severe shortage of rental properties we have in this country. And of course, skyrocketing rents, which is really bad news for tenants and really bad news for those that probably can least afford to be victims of uh, an experimental policy. But that was my first issue. And I was loud and clear that this was a mistake. I think that's proven to be correct. But as I said, I think this reflected initially the obsession that not just the Reserve Bank, but other policymakers have with the housing market, are buying into the, you know, the ridiculous housing market bubble sort of speculation, which is run with the media forever, just about. And again, it's been proven to be completely fallacious. So uh, that was the first issue. 
I think that that was also reflected during that period. If you remember, the Reserve Bank held interest rates on hold for a record period of time between 2016 and 2017. Despite the fact that our economy was clearly weak and weakening, uh, there's been some research to say that there were actually hundreds of thousands of jobs lost during that period because interest rates were kept too high for too long. In other words, there was no movement. And I think that was another product of this obsession from the Reserve Bank to um, worried about the housing market bubble. We didn't want to inflate it by dropping interest rates, even though the economy was sorely in need of it. And I think the recognition of that came at the second half of 2019, when the Reserve Bank panicked and cut interest rates three times through the back end of 2019, perhaps panic's a bit too strong a word, but I think they realised that the economy needed stimulus and that they had to let go of their concerns about the housing market. And and I think that was the first big issue that reflected the fact that they were looking in the wrong direction in terms of their monetary policy. The other thing that's, you know, when we look into the post-COVID period, and of course, what the Reserve Bank did through COVID, which was to slash interest rates to zero and to obviously stimulate the flow of money through the economy, everybody else did that. So I'm not sure they should get a pat on the back doing what everybody else did. But nonetheless, they did do that. And it was successful, of course, but it launched all that inflation. One of the other factors, and of course, we've had higher interest rates as a result since uh, May last year of the inflation that uh, that stimulus package created. But during that post or pre or the the pre-interest rate increase period, of course, Michael, we had quite a lengthy period where the Reserve Bank was saying there'd be no rate rises until 2024. Of course, that was completely wrong because we started uh, rate rises early in 2022, and there was a lot of criticism for that. And and as I said, you're entitled to an opinion, but gee whiz, you know, I think that's a long-term forecast. It shouldn't really be coming from those that um, hold the reins of interest rates the other thing that I've noticed, and perhaps this isn't in the in the remit of the Reserve Bank uh, or the control of it, but certainly we've seen some gouging from banks on interest rates as interest rates have increased. We've seen more, the margins of banks for their mortgage lending has increased. So I think there's been a little bit of gouging there from banks that have been pushing up rates more than what the official rates have been increased. So well, as I said, I'm not sure the Reserve Bank could do much about that, but maybe they could. But it does question the relationship between banks, APRA and the Reserve Bank. And and the other point is that the Reserve Bank's had a consistently poor record on forecasts, house prices. They embarrassingly had to backtrack significantly on their house price forecasts for this year. They got that completely wrong. Of course, they weren't alone there. Uh, The banks got it wrong. The media got it wrong. Most of the so-called forecasters got it wrong. But it wasn't just house prices. They've also been consistently wrong on their forecast for wages and the outcome in the labour market. And the other thing, just sort of finally, and I don't want to go on and on on here, but uh, I also think that their policy determinations, as reflected in their minutes of the meetings, has been a little mysterious. They're saying they're going to follow the data, and then the data's strong, and yet they put rates on on hold. The, the data is weak, and yet they increase rates. So there's a little bit of that, and, and some of the statements they make don't hold up in their minutes, don't hold up to what actually we see with the real data coming forward. So that's just a little bit of a spank from me, Michael, for the Reserve Bank and the Governor. And perhaps I think that this has contributed to their performance. We have to be here to hold these policymakers accountable for their decisions. But at the end of the day, we also recognise that they have a very difficult uh, situation, a very difficult position. I acknowledge that. But there'll be plenty of challenges thrown at the new Governor, and I wish her all the very best in her job. Well, there will be lots of challenges thrown at her, but on the other hand, she probably has been set up to succeed because a lot of the work's already been done and we can see that inflation's falling in the United States and consumer confidence remains low here and spending has dropped a little bit. So under her watch... Uh, inflation is going to come under control. Interest rates are going to come under control and she'll probably be a little bit more popular. I guess the question is, when is that going to happen? Yes, I, I don't share your optimism, Michael, but we'll see. Okay, let's look at the housing markets. And one of the things that I know my housing market keeps track of is home building costs. Unfortunately, they've risen, they've skyrocketed over the last couple of years because of supply chain issues, labour issues. And uh, you've got some updates on the latest quarterly house building costs, Andrew. Yeah, heading in the right direction in terms of the trend, Michael, but still rising, if you understand what I mean. Latest data is from the My Housing Market House Building Cost Index is derived from a building approval data that's released monthly by the ABS. 
And even though the trend is starting to ease, house building costs are still significantly higher than where they were a year ago. Of course, this is problematic because not only do builders face the systemic constraints of planning issues, uh, red tape, green tape, but now they're facing high building costs. So it means that we've got another roadblock in terms of matching supply with demand. And clearly we're an undersupplied housing market uh, almost across the board at the moment in our capitals. So the latest data showed us that although we had another increase in the index over May, we're starting to see an easing now in the rate of increases, up by 13.4% quarterly increase. That's the May quarter versus the May quarter last year. House building costs are still 13.4% higher, but you can see that the rate of growth is significantly lower than the 22.8% that was recorded over May last year, and which was a significant factor in pushing up inflation. So some better news there, but building costs are still rising sharply but not as sharply as they were. I can see two challenges. Still, builders are going to have trouble when most contracts are fixed price contracts. And so some builders are going to go to this wall as currently is happening. And that's a real shame for people in business. It also means some people who have got their homes being built stuck in limbo for a period of time. I guess the other side effect is that the next round of everything, whether it's homes, apartments, townhouses, they're going to be just so much more expensive, and that's going to push up the value of established properties, Andrew. Yeah, that's right, Michael. Uh, No sign yet that the uh, higher building costs are impacting commencements. We had the commencements data out last week, uh, but that was for the uh, March quarter. But uh, no sign yet that that's uh, impeding the out of the ground results from building approvals in terms of the number of commencements. But uh, I think that that's a, a likelihood going forward that we won't get the same relationship between commencements and approvals uh, because of the struggles that some developers will have, builders will have covering high building costs. And that'll mean that it'll be a bigger delay between you know when we get an approval and when we get an actual commencement of the job. Now, I know my housing market go very deeply into your research and data, and our housing markets are fragmented. They always have been, but they seem to be a little bit more so than ever. And you've recently brought out some data for our three big capital cities. Just seeing how the various sub-regions have performed, is there any theme there, anything that you've noticed? Well, if we look at the, the big eastern seaboard capitals, starting with Sydney, Michael, looking at the performance over the June quarter, the median June price, the change over the quarter and the change over the year, just to see where the, the better performance have been or the best performance have been. We can see in Sydney, the inner west has been had a strong performance over the June quarter with uh, median house prices now over $2 million over the June quarter and up by 5.6% over the quarter and up by 3.3% over the year. The inner west also is one of the leaders in uh, unit uh, performance as well, up by 6% over the quarter, up by 3.6% over the year. So similar results there for both units and houses in the inner west, Michael. So that's been uh, overall the strongest performance. The Northwest also, which is the Hills District, of course, when we look at the performance of houses, it was up by 3.3% over the quarter and up by 3.9% over the year. We know that Sydney market is continuing to produce very solid results, uh, dare I say, strong results. And uh, these are these are the leading performers. And when we look at the uh, top performer in terms of the unit market, it was actually the lower north, where the median now is at $1 million over the June quarter, up by 10.3% and up by 4.7% over the year. You just make that clear, that's 10.3% over a quarter. Now, it's not right to annualise it. You can't multiply it by four and say it's going to be 40% over. <laughs> Of the year. But I remember at the beginning of this year when you were the first of the regular economists and commentators to suggest the housing markets have turned, and in particular Sydney, yeah. and the facts have just uh, proven your forecast to be correct. I know you also suggested maybe 7 8% growth in Sydney over the year. Yeah. I think you got it wrong, Andrew. Yes, I think it's going to be stronger than that. Yes, Yes, I was just going to say, yeah, thank you very much for that. Is that a backhand slap? I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure, Michael, but uh, I don't mind being wrong. At least we've got the direction right, which all the others didn't get. But we've actually just about at that 8%. We're certainly at 7% now over the year so far, Michael, and we're really just over halfway through the year. And we've achieved that in Sydney. Mm. And uh, Sydney's now just a couple of percent below its all-time record highs in terms of house prices. So, uh, And when we do look at that data, and as you said, if you annualise it, 
you know, it's not going to be 40%, but it, it's about, that's why we look at the annual results that is comparing this quarter with the same quarter last year, because you take out a lot of the seasonality that can occur on a quarter by quarter basis. And of course, uh, that you get a much lower, but a more consistent result on that annualized figure. And we can see there that with the lower north, uh, it's increased 4.7% over the past year, four units. I think the point here is that you also need to look at the context over a longer period of time. And if we had like two year results, we'd see that it doesn't necessarily hold that those stronger results now are also stronger two years ago, because because uh, these markets are coming from a lower base and particularly the higher priced markets, such as the lower north, to a certain degree, the inner west are coming from a lower base. So they're in catch up mode, Michael, and that's why we're seeing some stronger results. But the, the northwest is interesting in Sydney, that Hills district, it's a, a consistent performer, but of course, it's a mid price market, dare we say an outer suburban market, the Hills District reflects consistent growth. So that's Sydney, we can have a look at Melbourne, Michael, where the performers in Melbourne have been, the top performers have been. Interestingly, that uh, well, not really a surprise, but the Outer East continues to be the strong performer in terms of the regions in Melbourne. Of course, uh, that's that area basically from Warrigal Road out to the Dandenongs. And um, they're up by 11.1% over the quarter, Michael. So strong result there, up by 2.2% over the year, which is the top result there for houses in Melbourne. The inner city had a strong result over the quarter, up by 6.2%, but flat over the year. And I think, again, that just does reflect that it's coming from a lower base, these markets that are performing more strongly over the quarter, or some of them are. And the top unit performance was the Western Suburbs, Michael. Um, they are up by 8.7% over the uh, quarter, but again, just up by 0.6% over the year. So uh, certainly not performing as strongly on the numbers, Melbourne versus Sydney, but some uh, revival there. But as usual, we shouldn't be surprised the Outer East is the top performer and really has been a, con a consistent top performer through the cycles, the ups and downs over uh, the last few years, Michael. How things have changed over the years. So when it was the inner suburbs in Melbourne before, I think a lot of the millennials are now priced out of that area. Yes, yes. And so they're looking as they're moving into family formation yes. stage for houses rather than apartments. And, and they've got to go just on that other side of Warrigal Road nowadays, don't they? Yeah, that's right, Michael, and very strong area. And, you know, I guess if you're a homeowner there, you're never really short of finding a buyer. But yeah, just another consistent performance from the Outer East uh, so far this year. But certainly the Melbourne market is reviving. We'll look at the auction clearance rates from the weekend just to get a sense of that. The eastern suburbs market, but interesting also to see some bouncing back from the western suburbs as well. Uh, and that's obviously a value opportunity there in the unit market in the western suburbs of Melbourne with that median at just 472000 over the June quarter. So we have the Brisbane market uh, just finishing off. And when we look at uh, Brisbane in terms of units, a very strong result there, Michael, in, from Brisbane City in terms of June quarter prices increasing by 2%, up by 7.1% over the year. You can see how much stronger the unit markets are in Brisbane compared to Melbourne and Sydney, Michael. This is actually the greater Brisbane region. So it also includes the Sunshine Coast and uh, Gold Coast Toowoomba areas. So we've sort of covered a bit more of a broader spectrum there for Brisbane. So it's greater Brisbane. And it is the main uh, local government areas. Uh, top performance there, value markets, Ipswich there up by 3.8%. Over the quarter, 3.7% over the year. Morton Bay, 4.8% over the quarter. Strong result from Morton Bay there and 2.7% uh, over the year. And Morton Bay has also been a strong performer in terms of units as well, Michael, up by 7% over the quarter and 9.2% over the year. The Gold Coast, uh, been a strong unit market for a couple of years and continuing to perform 5.5% over the quarter, 6.6% over the year. And Noosa, very, very strong over the quarter, up by 16.5% and 9.1% over the year. But we do get fewer observations uh, in Noosa, Michael. So that's why you can get those very strong results from period to period, because it can reflect the mix of properties coming through. And of course, we know there's a, a number of prestige uh, properties in that Noosa market. So that's our wrap for regional markets and some very interesting results. 
I just wanted to interrupt this week's Property Insider chat to remind you this is not specific investment advice because we don't know your personal circumstances, but we're more than happy to have a chat with you to help you take advantage of the new property cycle. If you think about it, an opportunity like this to get set at the beginning of a new property cycle doesn't happen very often. So why not have an obligation-free chat with my team at Metropole to discuss your goals and your options. Remember, we've got no properties for sale, but we offer strategic advice to give you direction results and certainty. This is the right time to get all your ducks in a row and get set for the opportunities that are going to abound. But be careful, property investment is a process, it's not an event, so you can't just go off and buy any property and hope to be successful. Formulating a plan and getting the right advice is more critical than ever now. So why not have a chat with the team at Metropole? Go to metropole.com.au. Now, we had a bit of a break over the winter school holidays. The auction market slowed down a little bit. Uh, auction clearance rates dropped. And, of course, that brought out the naysayer saying, yeah, look, I told you it was all over. They're saying that again at the moment because rentals, uh, vacancy rates that you reported recently crept up a little bit. And they said, oh, that's the end of it. Oh, look, there's more listings. That's the end of the market. They keep looking for reasons why the property markets are going to stop uh, growing. I can't can't see anything in those arguments at all. And the auction clearance rates are showing us that that's not the case at all either. No, it's called the silly season, Michael. It's uh, winter. You know, everybody's had a bit of a break from property, particularly after a strong autumn. But we're not going to see a lot of changes in the rental market because it's just a mismatch between supply and demand. But as we explained, holiday periods, we always see fewer connections with the rental market because people are on holidays and they put things off until the following month. So I would be surprised if we didn't see a bounce back in terms of vacancy rates when we get the July data, which is coming up in a couple of weeks because we're although we'll still have some impacts from holidays of course uh, through that period but we need to get through the winter period before we can start making big predictions about the housing market but it seems to be a favorite uh, pastime of uh, a number of Australians to uh, figure out what's happening in the housing market and interestingly enough most of them get it wrong that's okay but the auction markets yes again we're back from holidays now just about across the board we had some mixed results but I think the overall they were still positive and we'll look at those in a minute but certainly those exceptions exceptions were in the smaller market. So let's have a look at the clearance rates at the weekend, Michael. Again, we had a big rise in numbers, no surprise given return from holidays, higher numbers, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, and some quite strong results again. I mean, we basically had a two-week winter period, Michael, didn't we, which was just through the uh, last part of June where we did see lower clearance rates, particularly in Sydney. But that Sydney market's bounced back 74.2% clearance rate at the weekend, following that 77% the previous weekend. These are still clearly results in favour of sellers, Michael. So we can still call it sellers market. And it is winter, you know, so we do have a lower proportion of higher priced houses on the market this time of the year. And that really won't, uh, you know, in other words, we're not capturing the full market at the moment. And we won't really for another month or so. So and still to get these results, I think, is uh, encouraging. Just look at a year ago. 58% clearance rate in Sydney and uh, 60% in Melbourne, well ahead of that. Now, we know a year ago there was a lot of the scared uh, issues going on about higher interest rates and house prices crashing. But nonetheless, these are very good results for winter for both Sydney and Melbourne coming back from the holiday break. Uh, Brisbane down, as I said, there were a couple of exceptions. That was Brisbane and Canberra. Uh, Brisbane clearance rates down, uh, not a lot of reported auctions coming through, so that can be a factor, but certainly no numbers of auctions in Brisbane and a lower clearance rate. Adelaide just back now at its 80% results consistently after a couple of quieter weekends a month ago. And Canberra also, similar to Brisbane, had a, a quite a quiet result, 33.9% clearance rate, but again, fewer uh, observations sort of lended to that uh, result there in Canberra. And you can see the trends when we look at the trends, Sydney's well ahead of where it was a year ago and still tracking above uh, overall for July so far, still tracking above the 70%. Same story for Melbourne. Brisbane's fallen away a little bit this month so far compared to previous month. You've got to remember, Andrew, that Brisbane really isn't an auction market. When you have 46 auctions over the weekend, it's interesting to report, but it doesn't really prove a strong trend, does it? No, and, and the thing about Brisbane, Michael, is it actually picked up its auction culture during that yes. wave migration that we had during the COVID lockdown period. And we were starting, we started, Brisbane was starting to look like Melbourne and Sydney in terms of its auction market culture. Remember, we were getting 70% yes, yes. and we, we had a few 
weekends there with 80% clearance rates. And that was just because of very high demand, of course. But there's a different auction culture in Brisbane. Uh, they tend to use the auction process as a bit of an entree to the main event. So we shouldn't be too concerned, but it is interesting to see how the changes to the patterns in migration uh, change that Brisbane auction market. Having right. said that, as we've already reported, the underlying Brisbane market is still very strong. Absolutely. Maybe agents are a little bit lazy in Brisbane because they're not used to the auction culture and they can sell almost anything they list at the moment anyway. That's right, Michael. And as I said, uh, there's no doubt Brisbane, along with other housing markets, generally are, are uh, reviving. But look, we've got to take a lot of this, particularly the lower results with a grain of salt because it is the winter market still. But you know, And I do think it does reflect the strength of the Melbourne and Sydney markets, notwithstanding the seasonal effects that we typically have this time of the year. And I think the market is riding through those seasonal effects, Michael. And I think that's even sort of more encouraging than when we were getting strong results through autumn, which of course was a positive given, you know, the the unknown coming into this year. But, but the winter market to this point is still holding up very much uh, in terms of the Melbourne and Sydney results. And that was the strongest result of the year for Melbourne, Michael, the weekend, 79% clearance rate, top result this weekend. And, you know, no auction numbers rising as well. But as I said, this is about bottom middle end of the market because that's where we see most of the activity happening. There's virtually no activity happening in the higher priced markets in Melbourne at the moment, particularly the inner east, because, you know, people are still very much in holiday mode in those areas. And as I said, we won't see a a full mix of property in Melbourne and Sydney now for, for probably another month or so. But again, good results because even with a smaller proportion of the market, there's certainly still buyers out there quite active in the market it does in those lower price ranges. Well, lots happening in the market. We wish our new Reserve Bank yes, Governor, absolutely. Michelle Bullock, all the best. And I bet you we're going to be spending a bit of time talking about her in subsequent weeks. Thanks for your time, Andrew. Thanks, Michael. Now, as I said in the introduction, what you just heard was the audio of part of our weekly Property Insider video chats. If you enjoy my chats with Andrew Wilson, well, two things. First of all, if you don't already subscribe to this podcast, just please stop for a sec and follow or subscribe whatever your podcast app asks you to do so that twice a week you'll be kept up to date with my information and that of my guests. And if you want to see the video versions of my chats with Andrew Wilson, go to propertyinsider.info. I'll leave a link in the show notes and you can subscribe to our weekly YouTube videos. I'm also going to leave a link in the show notes for this particular episode so you can see some of the charts Andrew was talking about with regard to how the various sectors of our Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane property markets are performing. Now, in a moment, I'm going to share my mindset message with you, but as you could hear, our property markets have done pretty well. Now, yes, there's a little bit more stock coming onto the market at the moment. And yes, uh, rents are not growing as fast as they did, as you would have heard in last week's chat with Andrew Wilson, if you've been listening to our watching our Property Insiders videos. And so people are saying, ah, it's all over now. No, it's not. Property prices are not going to fall. They're not going to rise as fast as they did. In fact, I'm happy that they're not rising too quickly at this early stage in the property cycle. But house prices don't fall when there's a severe undersupply of housing stock, as we're currently experiencing in both the sales market and the rental market. House prices don't fall when the vacancy rates are around 1% and rents are skyrocketing as they currently are. House prices aren't going to fall when the unemployment rate's 3.5%, which means anyone who wants a job can get a job and can be able to pay for their mortgage. And house prices don't fall when auction clearance rates remain consistently above 70% like they have been throughout this year. If you think about it, half a million people came to Australia in 2022, and that just totally turned the supply and demand ratio on its head. And it's likely that a similar number of people are going to be coming in this calendar year. And these high immigration numbers are likely to continue for another couple of years, and we just can't produce enough housing stock. Our population's growing at about 2% per annum, and our housing stock's growing at around 1% per annum. And these numbers are going to underpin our property markets, and the migrants, they're coming here to set up new households, and they're driving demand, and they're also fueling our economy. 
I mean, if you think about it, we're not bringing in refugees. Many of these migrants are students, sure, and their parents are paying their way, but we've also got lots of new cashed up permanent residents, and they tend to rent for a year or two close to where their jobs are, and then they end up buying property. That's one of the reasons they've come to Australia. They want to own residential real estate. And so currently, they're not being affected by the high mortgage costs either, are they? In fact, their demand for goods and services is keeping our economy growing. And unfortunately, that may further push up inflation. But with the rest of the world's inflation coming under control, it seems like, well, inflation in Australia is on its way down. And who knows what's going to happen to interest rates, but we must be reaching the near the peak of the interest rate cycle. Now, this is all very interesting. But what are you going to do with this information? How long are you going to wait to take advantage of the new property cycle that started at the beginning of the year? All the research houses, not just Dr. Andrew Wilson, agree, and the banks agree that we've passed the housing market bottom earlier this year. So an opportunity like this, an opportunity to get set at the beginning of a new property cycle, that doesn't happen very often. And even though I don't advocate trying to time the market, In fact, that's what most of us would like to do if we could take advantage of it, isn't it? So how long are you prepared to wait to get set? Why not have a chat with my team at Metropole, have an obligation-free clarity consultation with one of our property strategists? We're much more than just buyers agents. We don't have any properties for sale. We offer strategic advice and give you direction, results and certainty. And then, only then, if you want to, our buyers agent will help you buy the right property. And we've got on-the-ground teams in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. We don't fly in and fly out like others or get other people who are on the ground to look at properties for us. We've got our own experienced team there. So, as I said, an opportunity like this to get set at the beginning of a new property cycle doesn't happen very often. So, why not organise a chat with my team at Metropole? metropole.com.au Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to have a chat with you about why maybe you should let go and not be so hard on yourself. It's a series of quotes I just read and I thought I'd share with you. And the first one said, let go. Hey, you've already failed at being perfect, and the harder you try, the more you beat yourself up when you inevitably fall short. You know what it's like. We tend to be our own worst critic, don't we? So maybe the next step is to stop trying to be everything you're not and start being everything you really are. Just show up better than you were yesterday. So rather than being perfect, just keep slowly, slowly improving. The problem is so many of us take on a bit too much. And if everything's a priority, nothing is. I remember years ago, there was somebody who used to work with for us at Metropole and everything was important and everything was urgent and his team didn't know what to do. This was years and years ago now, but it just came to me as I was talking to you about this. Um, And his team didn't know what were the priorities because if everything's a priority, nothing is. You don't have time to do everything, but you always have time to do the most important things. So if you're not sure what's important, write down at the beginning of each day, or a lot of people find it useful the night before, your daily most important tasks. The next thought then is to go ugly early. See, your prefrontal cortex, the executive function part of your brain, is like a battery and it gets drained throughout the day. So for most of us, morning is when your brain is charged and ready to make the tough decisions that require a lot of brain power. So the suggestion is have your crucial conversations first. You've probably heard a lot of people get up an hour early, journal, think about things, the 5 a.m. club. Uh, that, that's when a lot of the best thinking and work gets done. And another thought is that the more you tell yourself you have all the time you need, the more likely it is that you give yourself that time. You know, you, oh, there's not a hurry. I've got time to start investing. I've got time to start a relationship. I've got time to tell my boss I want a new job. But one day you're going to wake up and realize you should have started 10 years ago. So life doesn't come with an unlimited number of tomorrows. The best time to get started was yesterday. The next best time is now. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from 
this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?